everybody's here. So the lectures I'll be giving you the, over the next couple of months are on uh, kind of basics of outpatient pulmonology, pulmonary function testing, uh, obstructive and restrictive lung disease, and then I'll get into the more fun critical care stuff. I like to torture you all with pulmonology though. It's more fun. It's equations and things like that. No disclosures. So this lecture will talk about really the, the details of everything you get when you get uh, order a pulmonary function test. And it's something that when you have your patients in clinic that come with complaints of exertional dyspnea, cough, um, it can give you a lot of physiologic information about your patient in one test and can really point you in a diagnostic direction uh, because there's always the question, is it the heart, is it the lungs, or are they just really fat and out of shape? And the uh, PFTs can really help you not only answer that question, but quantify uh, what the, the disability is. So I'll talk about a basic overview of the lung volumes, spirometry, total lung capacity measurement, then some of the less common uh, things that show up on the PFT report and you don't know what to do with them, diffusing capacity, MVV, and then I'll talk about some adjunct testing that goes along with uh, PFTs. So indications are really either diagnostic or management. And you see in the diagnostic portion here, they're very general uh, reasons for getting pulmonary function testing. Asthma and COPD can often be clinical diagnoses, but many times you'll come uh, into clinic and your patient says, I, I get more tired when I walk to the refrigerator to get my cheeseburger. And you say, okay, well, let's, let's think about that. And the lung, the heart, anemia, all these things can cause exertional dyspnea. And uh, the PFT can really highlight, is it the lung, is it not? How, how much, uh, you know, how much are they decompensated because of the lung disease? Also can help answer questions about abnormal lung imaging. You'll have people with incidental findings on CT, like fibrotic changes, bronchiectasis, and the PFT can give you a measure of how much that's compromising the lung function. And then if you hear crackles, um, et cetera, you can get PFTs. Also, management. The mainstay in the pulmonary clinic uh, for management using PFTs is response to therapy. So you have somebody with COPD or asthma, interstitial lung disease, you follow them with serial PFTs every three to six months and see if the disease is worsening or if you've managed to slow the progression of disease. Um, preoperative risk stratification, it can be useful. The thoracic surgeons really like it because uh, pre-morbid lung function really is a good indicator of post-op pulmonary complications. And uh, finally, surveillance for known lung disease, as I said before, ILD, asthma, COPD. And you guys can uh, ask any questions at any time. So this is the uh, overview of the lung volumes that you see here. And the ones that can be measured with spirometry are here, which is the vital capacity, which is everything that your lungs can by effort inhale or exhale. And you can break it down. Total lung capacity is this vital capacity that you measure during spirometry, plus the residual volume, which is just sitting there and you can't get rid of it. Inspiratory capacity and FRC or another division. And then finally, Tidal volume and expiratory reserve volume are measured during spirometry. And tidal volume being the uh, main thing that we think about when we're thinking about mechanical ventilation, but really the uh, vital capacity and the uh, inspiratory reserve volume plus tidal volume plus expiratory reserve volume these two things being equal are the important things in the, the division of, of uh, lung volumes. So how does it work? Uh, for spirometry alone, you hook the patient up to a closed circuit here. So their lungs and the computer become one continuous 
tube clip on the nose so no extra air escapes. The patient makes a maximum inspiratory effort to completely fill up their lungs to their inspiratory capacity here. And then as fast as they can, they exhale aggressively all the way to the expiratory reserve volume. And while you're getting pulmonary function testing, spirometry, you uh, do this multiple times because it's important not only that <clears throat> the spirometry curves are similar to each other, showing that you're getting good data, you also want to give the patient the chance to get give their best effort because the best effort is the one that's reported on the pulmonary function testing. And the output that you get here for spirometry is flow at a given lung volume. So here on the x-axis is volume in liters. And on the y-axis is flow in liters per second. Your brain wants to put time here, but it's not time. So what it's showing is at a volume of two liters, your flow as you're exhaling is eight liters per second. The time mark here, FEV1, is the time at which you have exhaled for one second. And so that can be at any different volume depending on whether you have normal lungs, restriction, or obstruction. This is another way to look at the exhalation. So when the flow starts at zero, obviously, and as you blow out over time, so the x-axis here is time, you exhale more and more volume, and obviously you exhale a great majority of the volume very quickly if you have normal lungs, and then it takes a while to completely exit, uh, completely empty out your lungs and reach that vital capacity. And so this graph, you can measure FEV1, FEV3, FEV6. Sometimes they do that to look for um, obstruction in the very small bronchioles. And the determination of the flow at a given volume is based on the pressure gradient. So the, when you take an inspiration here, what you're doing is filling up the chest and creating a negative pressure inside the chest. And uh, there is or a positive pressure inside the chest at full inhalation. And then there's a pressure gradient. And with augmentation of the diaphragm, you can generate even more pressure gradient to maximally exhale. And so the, the flow, which is this V with a dot over it for whatever reason, um, is based on the pressure differential divided by the resistance of the airways and the respiratory system. And you can see that that flow changes over time and lung volumes because as the pressure gradient, as you exhale, the pressure gradient goes closer to zero until your full exhale. So the flow will decrease with less flow and the resistance does also play a factor and changes over time depending on what part of your airways are involved in the exhalation effort and how much of your diaphragm is left to push that extra air out. That's what I just said. And now you guys are doing the rapid response dance here. So to give some units to it, pressure gradient is in centimeters of water and you should be familiar with that from mechanical ventilation. The things that determine that pressure gradient are the lung capacity. If you can fit more air in your chest, there's more pressure inside. Diaphragm strength, if you can generate more force during a diaphragmatic contraction, you can generate more pressure. And finally, lung compliance. If you have lungs that are either very stiff or very emphysematous, there is not gonna be as much pressure generated as from a normal lung tissue with normal alveolar distension. Resistance, which has really crazy uh, unit here, which really takes into the account, um, this is an individual airway uh, perspective, but really it's kind of almost an integral of the entire respiratory system. Don't worry about the math. What the, air, what the resistance is determined by is the diameter of the airways, if there's any bronchospasm or secretions, and if there's any fixed airway obstruction, like uh, intrathoracic masses. And then finally, flow is in liters per second.
So the most important diagnostic measurements of the spirometry are your FEV1 and your FEC, where the FEV1 is the volume that is exhaled <clears throat> at one second, and the FEC being your entire exhalation. And the ratio is what determines if a spirometry loop is interpreted as obstructive, normal, or possibly restrictive. And the normal values for these are based on height, gender, and age. So normal spirometry looks like this nice graph here. You have a smooth inspiratory curve, and this is your peak expiratory flow. And then you see from here to here is the FEF 25 to 75 forced expiratory flow at 25% expiratory uh, time or expiratory capacity and then 75%. All right. And as you have decreasing lung volumes, what this is reflective of is more your diaphragmatic force and large airways, and then the ability of your medium-sized airways, bronchioles, to forcefully exhale air. And then when you get down here to the bottom, it's the very small airways and bronchioles. So obstructive patterns can show up as uh, scalloping in the medium size airways, just the small or everything. So that gives you information anatomically about where uh, abnormalities may be, pathologies may be. And so normal spirometry is a normal predicted FEC, FEV1, and then the FEV1 to FEC ratio is greater than 70. Obstruction you see as this scalloped pattern. So the red dot or red boxes here showing you what the normal would look like. And the obstructive, you see that at lung volumes, you get much less flow than in a normal. And so what that means is the airways are either narrowed or bronchospastic and air is less able to flow past that, those high resistance areas. So obstruction, is indicative of higher airway resistance. Usually this is gonna be COPD or asthma uh, for the large majority of patients that you're gonna see in your clinic. And to diagnose an obstructive pattern, the FVC, how much you can exhale total is normal, possibly decreased. The FEV1 is decreased, so it takes you much longer to get out uh, after one second, you are able to exhale less air. That's the best way to put it. And so the FEV1 to FEC ratio is less than 70. That's your diagnostic marker for obstruction. And severity is rated by the percent predicted of a normal FEV1, and it's categorized as mild, moderate, severe, or very severe obstructive ventilatory deficit. That's what you'll see on the PFT reports. When patients are suspected of asthma, COPD, or in fact, if you see an obstructive pattern on your initial spirometry, then you can give a bronchodilator challenge and they give four to eight puffs of albuterol and then go again. And a bronchodilator response is considered positive if you have a 12% increase and a greater than 200 mil increase from a baseline FEV1 value. So that's to say, let's say the FEV1 is here at four liters. After you give the bronchodilator, you get a higher flow and thus more volume. And this is another way to look at it on the seconds versus volume graph. You get more volume out after that one second mark. And this can be indicative of asthma classically you can see bronchodilator responses with a lot of other diseases, including COPD. And if you do see it, you may think about an asthma COPD overlap syndrome. Restriction is shown by a small spirometry loop. And basically what's that showing is the FVC is smaller. So the patient is unable to take in as big a breath because there's not as much space in the lungs. And the restrictive pattern, you'll see the FVC decreased, FEV1 decreased, and then the ratio greater than 70. If you only get spirometry, you'll get this read, suggestive of a restrictive ventilatory defect. 
because you need total lung capacity values to make an actual diagnosis of restrictive lung disease. And these things can also, also occur together. So this is a loop of somebody with uh, interstitial lung disease. And you can see how they have a restrictive pattern with a low FVC, and then also a pretty rapid scalloping showing obstruction of flow. And you'll have your PFT reads as obstructive and restrictive, and then the severity of each. So some limitations when you're getting spirometry, if they're coughing a lot, the test is useless because you get all kinds of spikes. You can't get that nice uh, flow volume curve that is comparable to other ones and then pick the best one to get actual values. So patients that are coughing a lot, you might just have to quit. Also patient effort. So they have to give their very best maximal voluntary effort for it to be diagnostic. And the respiratory therapists that do PFTs will comment on this um, some people, as you know, like to deceive you about their diagnoses and may give a poor effort to look worse. And another thing to think about is spirometry is really not diagnostic. It's more a descriptive tool. So it goes along with your clinical information to tell you what kind of physiologic problem is going on in the lung and how severe it is. So summary for that first part, um, the spirometry measures expiratory airflow at a given lung volume. The common descriptors you'll see and be tested on are FUV1 to FVC and their ratio. Obstruction is a result of increased airway resistance, and you see that show up more at low lung volumes because that is all of the, the residual air trying to get out of the small airways that may be bronchospastic or otherwise obstructed. And restriction is a result of low lung capacity. So total lung capacity is low, and that's seen on spirometry as a low forced vital capacity. That's a cat with an inhaler. Any questions about that first part? Yeah, it's important. It's good, good technique. <laughs> sure. Mm -hmm. And so at that point, you can look at the shape of the flow volume curve. And in those cases, you may see obstruction at very small airways only. And that can be read a lot of times at the discretion of whoever's reading the PFT as a minimal obstructive ventilatory defect when you get that in between gray zone. Though if the spirometry loop looks very normal, they'll read it as normal. So that, that's where that um, FEF 50, FEF 75 come into play and actually looking at the shape of the curve because you can have a curve that looks normal all the way up to these little airways and then it goes whoop like that. And with that sound effect too, yeah, yeah it goes boop. And uh, that may give you a ratio of 75% or so, and then it'll be up to the interpretation of who's reading the PFT. They'll get, yes, you have to specifically request a methicoline, uh, but they will do, unless you say not to, a bronchodilator response challenge. The methicoline test has to be specifically ordered for a couple of reasons. One is it can provoke status asthmaticus, which is bad, so you have to be aware of that. And also it's really used when you have a high clinical suspicion of asthma, in particular asthma, and you have normal spirometry, which often happens, especially if people have triggers like cold or exercise, and if they're just in the clinic sitting there, they're gonna have normal loops. The methicoline is designed to provoke asthma to diagnose it, and it's kind of a second step. If you have normal PFTs, but still are thinking about asthma, you send them back to the lab for another round. <laughs>
All right, so we're able to measure our inspiratory reserve volume, tidal volume, expiratory reserve volume. How do we get this mystery residual volume in there and get the total lung capacity so we can talk about restrictive lung disease? Anybody want to try to say this word? Who said that? Oh, you cheated. Yeah, you know it. Okay, so plethysmography can measure functional residual capacity, and you can put that together to get your total lung capacity when you get spirometry. And the idea behind this is Boyle's law that a pressure at an initial volume is going to be equal to the different pressure at the different volume in a closed system. And your closed system is you trapped in a box. And by you, I mean your patient. And how this is done is the box has a known volume and you can measure the pressure in it at a given time. You can measure change in airway pressure during spirometry and respiratory efforts where the mystery is how much FRC is in the patient. And so you can use that P1V1 equals P2V2 to actually get a value for the FRC. So how this works is you get your, get them breathing comfortably, and then you close, you have them uh, breathe, and you get this flow pressure loop, and then you close the shutter, and what that does is they're breathing against resistance that takes the flow to zero, so you're able to calculate a static intrathoracic pressure, extrathoracic pressure, you know this volume in the box, and that allows you to calculate the volume left in the chest. No. That would be mean. And the vent's not set up to do it. <laughs> um, so closing the shutter eliminates the flow, so you get this. Uh, if there's flow, there has to be a pressure gradient. If there's a pressure gradient, you can't measure what the actual pressure is, which is what you're looking for for this calculation. So um, a static pressure is required to assume that airway pressure equals alveolar pressure. And then you get the pressure in the box initially, volume in the box initially, pressure in the box at end inspiration, volume at end inspiration. So what that is looking at is how does the pressure change between when the patient has resting tidal volume and only the FRC left in the lung. And that allows you to calculate the residual volume. Another way to get a total lung capacity measurement is called nitrogen washout. And it uses a similar concept that's based on the ideal gas law that concentration of gases at a given volume are equal to a same concentration of the gas at a different volume. So if you have a similar, if you have a certain amount of nitrogen in a closed space, and then you expand that space by increasing the pressure, the nitrogen concentration is going to go down to a known degree based on the volume. So how the nitrogen washout works is you give the patient a hundred percent, you have them breathe room air for a while, then you give them a hundred percent FiO2 and then have them breathe into a closed sack, collect all the nitrogen that was in their air, and the rate of accumulation of this nitrogen can be used to calculate the total lung capacity. So why would you choose one versus the other? Um, patients that have obstructive lung disease, restrictive lung disease, and are not super obese can fit in this box. The main problem, to fitting this box is literally size. Because uh, these body boxes were designed in the 70s and 80s when people didn't weigh 500 pounds. Like you got somebody that was 250, you're like, wow, that's a big boy. Uh, not anymore. That's an average boy now. <laughs> and uh, the nitrogen washout method is good for the big people, but is not good for people with obstruction because they're going to take a long time to exhale that extra nitrogen and it's going to, or give, going to give you a falsely elevated total lung capacity. 
So the computer does math for the nitrogen. Like it's like all kinds of stuff here. You don't even need to know about it, but uh, basically they calculate the FRC from time to nitrogen equilibrium between the lungs and the bag that you're breathing out in. And then they measure the concentration of the exhaled nitrogen over time. And this cat is the one doing the calculations always. So this is an example of the PFT report that you'll get when you get full PFTs. You'll get observed values. So these are, this is the hard data. Um, the predicted values for a patient of your patient's age, height, and gender, and then what percent of predicted is. So the spirometry portion here gives you the FVC, FVV1, and then the ratio. The body box portion gives you the total lung capacity, the FRC, and then some smaller divisions of it, which are really less important. And then the diffusing capacity of carbon monoxide and alveolar ventilation. To focus in on the total lung capacity part here, uh, restrictive ventilatory defects are, are uh, divided into what percent of predicted they are. And so less than 80 is mild, less than 65 is moderate, less than 50 is severe. If the lung capacity is higher than predicted, that reflects chronic air trapping and uh, hyperinflation. And that can be seen in patients with obstructive lung disease, COPD in particular. And you'll actually see a very high residual volume in those patients. So if you have a very high total lung capacity and a high residual volume, you're trapping air. If you have a high lung capacity and a normal residual volume, then you're Lance Armstrong. So those are the kind of the subtleties of it. Um, but this is a good indicator of air trapping and lung capacity. So it's not only for restriction. Oh, that's going to be mine later. <laughs> Break? Okay, never mind. It'll be okay. Mm, good stuff. So the diffusing capacity of the lungs to carbon monoxide, that's where DLCO comes in, really measures the efficiency of the lungs in terms of how the oxygen gets from the alveolar space through the basement membrane into the capillary and loads onto the hemoglobin. So the diffusing capacity tells you how good are the lungs at getting oxygen into the blood. And it depends on the alveolar surface area. So the normal alveolar surface area of lungs is about the size of a tennis court if you spread it all out. If you have emphysema, if you have interstitial lung disease and lose a percentage of that, your diffusing capacity is going to be less efficient. The thickness of the alveolar capillary membrane is important because it takes time for the oxygen to get through the basement membrane between the alveolus and the capillary. And if you have interstitial lung disease, pulmonary edema, anything that thickens that membrane, it's going to take longer for the oxygen to get in. And also capillary blood volume. So the blood that's flowing through the pulmonary capillary circulation and how much hemoglobin you have is going to determine the efficiency of oxygen onloading. Here's a picture. So your interstitial space here, you got your capillary, you got your alveolus, and oxygen goes this way and latches on to the red blood cell, and that's your diffusion of oxygen. And passively, carbon dioxide diffuses as well across the gradient. So the diffusing technique is similar to a single breath nitrogen washout. And the patient will completely exhale and then breathe in a special cocktail of a little bit of carbon monoxide, helium, oxygen, and nitrogen. Hold breath for 10 seconds. And so what that does is let the circulation through the pulmonary capillaries take up that carbon monoxide that's sitting in there. And remember, carbon monoxide has an extremely high binding affinity for the hemoglobin 
And so that carbon monoxide, unlike oxygen, will not just kind of sit there and reach an equilibrium. It'll seek out those blood cells that are coming by and latch on. Then you exhale the dead space gas, which is everything that isn't participating in gas exchange in the lungs. And then you measure the gas composition that comes out from the FEF 25 to 75, which is reflective of most of the lung volume that is actually participating in gas exchange. And you see how much carbon monoxide is left in that exhaled gas. If a lot of it is left, that means that your diffusing capacity is poor. If, you, if none of it is left, that means that you're really binding oxygen well, because this is really a surrogate for oxygen binding. The reason the helium's in there is a couple of reasons. It uh, is a lighter gas than air and takes out some of the obstruction or obstructive ventilatory defect that may cause readings that are not accurate of the DLCO. And also you can compare the ratio of inspired and expired helium to once again, validate your exhaled carbon monoxide to make sure that your diffusing capacity is a real value. And so you get a lot of information from this one value based in the context of spirometry and imaging. And really the main ones that you'll see that are important to think about, you have a low DLCO and reduced total lung capacity. What that's telling you is that your restrictive ventilatory defect is probably from interstitial lung disease and you have injury to the pulmonary interstitium, to the uh, capillaries, and you may have destruction of alveolar tissue. So this represents reduced amount of lung tissue and probably thickening of the basement membrane that makes the lung less efficient at taking up oxygen. If you have a dis decreased diffusing capacity in normal spirometry, that may make you think about anemia or heart failure where you have an actual decreased oxygen carrying capacity from a cardiac perspective. So this is actually a very common finding in somebody that you send to PFTs for shortness of breath and all the spirometry is completely normal, but the DLCO is low. That may, may make you think about these. And often you know, from a broader perspective, when you are working up exertional dyspnea, um, echocardiogram should really go hand in hand with the pulmonary function testing to give you kind of a full physiologic profile of the important organs uh, that are in the body and help make your diagnosis. This is kind of a corner case, increased diffusing capacity. Uh, you can see it with pulmonary hemorrhage because the blood is sitting right there in the airway. So obviously it's gonna take up the oxygen very quickly. Um, occasionally you'll see it with people with hemoglobins of 20. And uh, normal DLCO and reduced total lung capacity is extra pulmonary restriction as opposed to interstitial lung disease. So these are people with obesity, hypoventilation. These guys can't fit in the body box. Other things that you'll see measured are uh, maximal voluntary ventilation, maximal inspiratory pressure, and maximal expiratory pressure. And these are measurements of diaphragmatic strength. Uh, the maximal voluntary ventilation patient takes as deep a breath and as rapid exhalation as possible during 12 seconds. And the amount of liters blown out during that big effort is the maximal voluntary ventilation. And FUD1 times 35 is a predicted MVV for a given patient. And what does this tell you? Patients with neuromuscular disease with a fatigability such as myasthenia gravis, you'll see a decreased maximal voluntary ventilation because they'll get weaker over time. Maximal inspiratory pressure and maximal expiratory pressure, these are the normal values, um, are sometimes used to calculate diaphragmatic strength, uh, though there's extreme variability in how these are performed and they're generally not useful if you have somebody that you're suspecting has hemidiaphragm paralysis, 
ALS, something like that. These may be values that can augment your diagnosis, but you're not gonna make any diagnosis with these. They're better in the settings of people with acute neurologic injury to the diaphragm to measure the trajectory of the disease. So if their MIPS and MEPS are changing for better or worse, it doesn't matter what the true value is, but it gives you an indicator of, for instance, if you have a myasthenic crisis, you're giving steroids and IVIG, is their maximal inspiratory and respiratory pressure improving or not? It can also be a marker for impending respiratory failure in inpatients with neuromuscular disease. You also get an ABG tacked on to your pulmonary function testing as a bonus. And uh, it's a room air ABG. And so it can give you, once again, good information. Let's say your chief complaints, exertional dyspnea. You get a normal room air ABG, probably somebody with asthma. Somebody with a, in the 60-60 club with a compensated respiratory acidosis and a little hypoxemia, that's this guy or somebody that has a little bit of a respiratory alkalosis, normal CO2, hypoxemia. This is your uh, blue bloater here, chronic bronchitis. So he's a little alkalotic because he's tachypneic to compensate for his hypoxemia. You can also order a six minute walk. And this, you know, oxygen saturation has not been mentioned at any point prior in the PFTs here. And this is, where you can actually see if your patient has an oxygen requirement. So if you have somebody that comes into your clinic with chief complaint of exertional dyspnea and their room air O2 sat is 92%, that's not normal. And you can get diagnosed the need for oxygen with a six minute walk test, but also you can get data about how far they can walk in six minutes, what their oxygen saturation does and also what their perceived per fatigue is. And this is useful not only for diagnosing the need for oxygen, but also for serially following treatments. So somebody with interstitial lung disease, for example, may have an impaired ability to oxygenate and an impaired ability to walk. You prescribe them pulmonary rehab, you optimize their cardiac function, you retest it, and maybe they have an improvement in their oxygen needs and distance walk. If patients decrease over time, this is one of the indicators that can tell you that it might be time for a lung transplant if they have a primary pulmonary problem. And um, in addition to that, this is very often an endpoint of studies that can't look at mortality because the uh, incidence of mortality from diseases like COPD over maybe a two to three year period is too low for a lot of interventions to show. But if you have an improvement in your six minute walk distance and oxygen needs, that's a good endpoint for studies to say, hey, our drug works, buy it. So summary for that part, um, you can get that functional residual capacity by comparing the pressure and volume in the chest and the body box or with nitrogen washout. You can calculate your total lung capacity by adding up the FRC plus inspiratory capacity, and that can confirm restrictive ventilatory defects seen on spirometry or hyperinflation and air trapping. Don't ignore the diffusing capacity of carbon monoxide because that can give you good information about whether the lungs are working correctly or whether you're dealing with interstitial lung disease and a problem with oxygen onloading onto hemoglobin. You can measure respiratory muscle strength if you need to, and then you get a lot of additional information to guide diagnosis and therapy with your ABG and six minute walk. That is uh, not a cat in a body box, so but that's the closest I could find. Some, some vets use uh, gas uh, rather than IV medications to put cats and dogs to sleep. And it is uh, less traumatic for the animal and has a lower, lower rate of mortality. Just so you know, a little bit of veter veterinary medicine there. And this is what's gonna be on your tests and boards and stuff, so. Any questions about all of that? So I encourage you to order 
PFTs and follow up on them in your medicine clinic, when to refer to pulmonology, you don't want to refer right after you get your PFTs. Uh, you can manage basic COPD asthma. When to refer to pulmonology is when you need to escalate therapy for COPD or asthma in particular. And they're on really two or more medications. That's too much to manage as a generalist. Also, if you make a diagnosis of new interstitial lung disease, if you make a diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension, those kind of things you want to refer. But your asthma COPD, uh, you can keep in your clinic, and these PFTs can give you good information about how their lungs are working. And hey, maybe if they quit smoking and lost some weight, you'd have better PFTs a year later when you check them again. Totally useless. The reason why is you want to get these PFTs <clears throat> to show the patient's best numbers. So getting them while they're acutely ill, kind of like getting an echo in somebody that's in decompensated heart failure is not really a good value because you're seeing them in a decompensated state and you want to see what their good baseline is in, as an outpatient and use that as a comparator. The exception being cardiothoracic surgery and some other surgeries will require PFTs prior to doing an intervention and they will order them on inpatients. The inpatient PFTs, if the patient's healthy enough to go up to the PFT lab and do it, sure, that's probably a little better, but the bedside spirometry values are extremely variable. The patients aren't positioned correctly. There's alarms and nurses and everything. It's just not a good test. Yeah, so if you were to get data from an inpatient one, you're looking through your clinic discharge summary, and you're like, eh, I don't know about this. I would just order another when the patient's at their baseline. All right, thanks for your attention, guys.